So this is a series of slides from various places on ponds and then we'll get into some water stuff, uh, other water stuff here. So notice um, if this was facing south, we all, we all know that when the water hits a pond surface, it bounces light off uh, to the north of it here. So if this was facing south, this spot here, this bank is going to get an extra lot of heat and light, which means good growing conditions. And so they built these little peninsulas out into the pond here and they have gardens growing in them. It's all totally sub-irrigated. It's, um, it's, uh, this is a really great growing situation they put together here. So when you do have bodies of water, you can use the edges of them in creative ways. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good one there. This is a pond in Nepal. I thought it was a very aesthetic garden area, but see all that red stuff on the surface? That's a zola which is a, you know, a floating aquatic vegetation that fixes nitrogen. So it's a nitrogen fixer and the, a pond like this, they can scoop that off periodically and use it in the garden as a fertilizer. You can also imagine, again, that's cutting evaporation loss. And in many cultures, especially in China, they drain the ponds periodically, scrape up all the muck and all the nutrients at the bottom and then use it as fertilizer. In China, it was very common that they would compost that mud from the bottom of the pond with clover and other, um, other rich uh, green matter to make super composts. Uh, different plants take up, have different oxygen demands, and I, I'm not an expert on which plants. Have you ever seen a pond with plants and fish in it? I have. I've seen a lot of ponds that have. So, can they reduce? So, what I know that there's eutrophication of ponds. You've dumped too much phosphorus in them. That's that, that's an algae boom. This is not algae. This is a zola. It's a you know it's a plant. Algae is a little different. Azola, A Z O L L A. And there's and they azola. There's azolas that grow here. I'm pretty sure. I see them in temperate and. There's a good question. Somebody, somebody, it's a research project. What happens when you integrate a lot of waterfowl into the system? Because are they going to uh, oxygenate it by their activities? But they're also putting poop and fertilizer in there, which is in a sense may encourage a, a type of growth that reduces oxygen. I don't know the answer. Have you ever seen a clean waterway with waterfowl in it? Heck yes. You know. So in other words. You, you know, we know that waterfowl and plants and water and fish can all coexist. So, you know, there can be bad assemblages, but we know we can do good assemblages. Uh, this is a mini, a teeny weeny little pond, and so I encourage people around their houses to have little ponds in the landscape as well as big ponds in the bigger landscape. So there's all scales of ponds for depending on the landscape and depending on the water availability. And this is, you know, but you got a little water plants in there. It looks like water crests, a few other odds and ends. I have, in one of my places, we have a trout pond, but other, all the other places have no water systems. Yeah, it's, it's not feasible everywhere. Um, and when we get further on, we'll, be, we'll probably address that a little bit more as we go along. And here's another aesthetic you know, backyard in Seattle, but it's just a charming place to sit. And this was a guy in Hawaii who had a series of small water ponds and he was a nursery, aquatic plant nursery, so he needed to keep something separate. So ponds can also be a source of income in that you can sell water plants. Papyrus in a small pond, you know, and they, they actually made a hill of material and then dug the pond into the hill rather than going straight into the landscape there because in this landscape, it was, uh, this is in Hawaii on the, uh, on, on, actually on Maui in a, on the oh, Ulapalakua side where it's just like straight lava, you know, you can't, you can't dig a hole in it and have a pond very well. So they just piled cinders probably up and made a hole in the middle to hold their little pond. So this is again a Zola on another pond with water plants around it, some gardening. Um, 
you can see it just adds a lot of lushness to a landscape. And ponds can have many purposes, of course. They can be used for watering livestock. Do you want to have the livestock wander in and wait around in the pond to get their water? No, you always want to get water out of a pond or out of a stream. You usually, we would generally say, don't let livestock have access to waterways because they use them as flush toilets. And so whenever I see cows right in a stream in Montana or anywhere else, I'm always kind of a little disgusted about that. Um, that's a gunner of water plant. You, I don't think we would grow it here, so. This is an aquaculture system. This is one of the guys in that Akamai backyard, Don Hecox. He, he has a series of aquaculture ponds and he raises tilapia and other fish in here and he raises a lot of them. I mean, those things have a lot of fish in them. And then the effluent from the water goes off to water taro plants and other things down, you know, below them. So that's water hyacinth. And water hyacinth is famous for choking waterways in Florida and many other parts of the tropics. But it's good livestock feed here. It's shading the water, it's cooling the water, it's keeping the water cooler. It's keeping it shadier. The fish are probably here some more or here lesser grown. But I think, you know, and again, vegetation, at least in those warm subtropics, is probably better for the fish than just the straight water. But again, it might vary from fish species to fish species. But again, if you're going to have aquaculture, you don't want to dump that polluted water right back into a, a stream. You want to put it onto the land so you can take the nutrients. You don't want to dump the nutrients in the water, and you don't do that because it's you know. And you want to uh, get more yield out of it. It's sort of like it's like dumping dollar bills into the stream and watching them wash away. You should be taking advantage of them. Uh, this is a horrible slide. It was a dark day. This is in Nepal, and this guy had built this big pond here, and he does fish in there, and he also raises bamboo, and he throws all his bamboo in there for a period of time and where all the starches and sugars in the bamboo leach into the pond to feed the plant ecology, then when he takes the bamboo out, it will be much less susceptible to being eaten by insects. So he makes his bamboo furniture w last longer and he's getting nutrient input into the water um, by doing this. Again, it's just nice uh, stacking systems here. This is uh, paddy culture in Asia, it's so common. In fact, they're trying, the people that are, in, that are looking at long-term climate change on the globe and heating, these things produce a lot of methane. And so they're trying to get people to have wheat, rice varieties and, and technology, ways of raising rice that have less paddy in the system or less timing of the water systems. But in, in Asia, it's very typical that they'll be, uh, they, in the Philippines, for instance, and some other places, they'll have an especially deep trench along one side. And then during the paddy system, they introduce really fast growing fish and shrimp and mollusks and, and maybe things that will live in there, grow. And then when they drain the paddy to harvest the rice, all this deeper area, all the organisms all go into that deeper area and they just go in there with a net and, and get a lot of extra protein. So again, it's getting how many different yields can you get out of a system is how permaculturists are supposed to be thinking. How many yields can you get out of each system? Um, this is some, um, again, raising fish. This is in Hawaii and Pohoi Hoi Lava area, which means that you can't dig a hole. So he's just taking a bunch of kiddie pools and he, yeah, again, you see there's a canopy overhead. It's a shady system. He's got water plants on here. He must have to bubble oxygen in there a bit or something, but he grows big tilapia and big carp and big fish in there. So again, it's, it's a protein food source. Uh, and all these ponds are filled with roof water from his buildings. So he catches the roof water and then gets all this yield out of it. In the hottest part of the year, I believe he even throws a bit of uh, black, uh, you know, shade netting over that. Or in the winter, if you wanted it a little bit warmer, you could throw a clear plastic sheet and make it more of a greenhouse if you're in a, in a temperate region. 
So here we are, this is a way of making a really fast water storage. As you know, tanks cost money. This is being filled off of Kenny Loggins. He's a, Kenny Loggins is some big famous music guy and he has a place in Hawaii and we were doing a course at his place and we were, we, we were taking roof catchment and storing it in this, in this pond. So you can see it's a, what we call cattle panel or fencing here, I believe, something similar. And then, then inside here there's like chicken wire and then it's, it's on a nice gravel base nice level gravel base. And then you put a membrane, uh, a, you know, a thick, especially thick plastic. It's not just like, you know, this is a pond liner, uh, thicker stuff than uh, you go down and buy in the grocery store. And then uh, you can see we're just starting to fill it up. But it just took us part of a day to construct. It's relatively cheap to do this compared to buy in a big plastic tank. Um, Again, you could cover it or something uh, to reduce evaporation. But ferro cement is pretty similar to this, except there's rebar, there's a framework of rebar, and then, and then there's various layers of wire in there, and then you push cement into it, and you end up with a wall that's maybe only that thick. It's a really thin, thin wall, uh, concrete and metal, and you can build 20,000 gallon cisterns out of ferro cement the Bullock brothers have one on their island. Really huge. So ferro cement is also a relatively inexpensive uh, way of getting uh, water tanks. There's our finished product.